Hello listeners, this is Adam, and today I'm interviewing John Smart, who is a developmental systems theorist who studies accelerating change, computational autonomy, and the singularity. He is the president of Accelerating Studies Foundation, a non-profit community for research, education, consulting, and selected advocacy of communities and technologies of accelerating change. He also presented a talk at the first Singularity Summit at Stanford in 2006. He is the author of Acceleration Watch, which is formerly Singularity Watch, which was first founded in the late 90s, which deals with writings of, on accelerating change, evolutionary development, the technological singularity and future studies. And he is an advisor in future studies and forecasting at the Singularity University. First of all, um, tell us what you do, John. I'm a uh, technology futurist. So I look at where change is going uh, in the technology space and some of the social, political, economic impacts of that. And, um, I've been doing it for about 10 years. 10 years. And you had um, Singularity Watch as a, a website early in the uh, 2000s or late 90s, is that correct? Yeah, Singularity Watch was my uh, first website discussing accelerating change from a universal or a global perspective, uh, accelerating technological change. And I think it was the first one on the planet that focused on that. And If you ever saw the header of my uh, website, it has a little black hole in the right hand corner and the um, radical idea that I had at the time was that um, as change goes faster, um, the systems that process uh, change get more uh, compactified in space, uh, time, energy, and matter. Uh, more dense, what I call stem compression. So increasing stem density, space, time, energy, and matter, and increasing stem efficiency of computation or physical transformation. And so if you extrapolate that out, the most advanced systems start to look more and more like a black hole, which is very interesting because if we continue on that trend, uh, a system that is more and more dense um, is uh, in many ways more and more protected from the uh, fluctuations of the environment. So it's like almost like the universe is packaging up its intelligence into uh, more and more localized, highly resilient uh, structures and you can pretty much say that's what the transition from biology to technology is if you have a technological self you've obviously got it backed up zillions of times and uh, it has many new capability uh, it has many new um, um, capabilities and resiliences that you don't see in biological systems um, you've talked about intelligence being modeled from biological systems what do you mean by that well when we when we think about how technology is, as Ray Kurzweil would say, transcending our biology, um, perhaps it's more accurate to say technology is being modeled after biology. It's being more and more biologically inspired. Um, and I think that's very exciting because humans are the most complex thing in the known universe so far. 100 trillion unique synaptic connections here in this three pound piece of electromagnetic meat. And um, if technology can gain that kind of uh, um, complexity, um, uh, there's a whole lot of interesting things it could do with it. Um, there's limitations in the biology, obviously. Um, well, there's efficiency, so we uh, use 100 watts in our brains to do all of this incredible higher order thinking and, and, and consciousness that we have. We don't have any machines that are anywhere near as efficient for energy yet. Um, but as they become more biologically inspired, I think they will go in that direction. Um, and so what uh, we see with uh, as the benefits of biology that technology doesn't have, uh, we can take those as designers and engineers as, uh, as challenges to try and figure out how to uh, implement them in our technology. And as the technology becomes more like biology, uh, it's able to do more things more naturally in ways that uh, fit with human beings um, 
also in more socially acceptable ways. This drive that we have to make humanoid robotics, for example, uh, we'd rather have a machine, an intelligent machine that looks something like us, that we can relate to using the social um, gestures and uh, um, um, evolutionary psychology that we've currently got. And um, a machine that's more like a human is more multi-purpose. You know, it takes uh, maybe 300 robots and maybe 300 uh, robot polishers, as uh, Tom Friedman would say, to make a Lexus today. But roll that forward 20 or 30 years, and you won't have 300 robots on the assembly line. You'll have uh, maybe 30, and they'll be more and more multi-purpose. So you can reuse those servos for more and more things. Uh, each robot becomes more flexible, more uh, capable of uh, doing many different things, more intelligent, more adaptable, more biologically inspired. And that's the direction, obviously, we want to go. And we can see the far, far future where you've got your one Unimate, your totally universal robot that's able to do just about anything for you. And that's pretty much what a human being is. As uh, I think it was Robert Heinlein said, specialization is for insects. Uh, and so as our machines are insect-level intelligence, they're going to be highly specialized. But as they get more advanced, they're going to become more like us. And uh, that's something we we aspire to in our technology.